three weeks ago now, uh, actually two weeks ago, that we went through the passage in 1 Timothy chapter 1, where Paul told Timothy, I left you in Ephesus to charge certain men not to teach a different doctrine. And then he said the purpose of this charge or the end of this charge is so that men will have a pure heart and a good conscience and an unfeigned faith and, of course, love coming out of that pure heart. And so we talked about the fact that some churches are so focused on keeping the gospel pure that they never quite get around to what's the gospel actually supposed to do to us. And it's a fine balance. It's really tough sometimes to to know as a preacher What should I be spending most of my time on? Should I be spending a lot of time on the errors and the false teachings and the false doctrines that are surrounding the church right now? Or should I spend time on the personal lives of the brethren and growing and developing? Or should I somehow or another put them both together and be the perfect preacher, which I've been trying to do for years, but uh, not sure I'll ever get there. But what we started with last week was this notion of a good conscience. What is a good conscience? That's a really difficult thing. I've wrestled with this for years. Matter of fact, I think I told you I hadn't really preached on this. I've I've looked at it, I've thought about it, and I've just kind of put it on the back burner because there's really no information except in the scriptures, and there's not a lot of information in the scriptures. So when somebody asks me, what exactly is a good conscience? I can't really give them a definitive answer. I'm going to give them the answer that, that I've got this evening, and we'll kind of look at it. But the reality is that a good conscience can feel guilt and a good conscience can feel remorse and look back on their past life and wish that things had gone differently. And we'll develop that as the lesson goes on. But what we would normally think of as a good conscience, which would be a conscience that is never bothering us, that we're always doing what's right and we feel really good about ourselves and we can look back on our lives and just say, you know, every decision I made was a good one. And that's just not what the scriptures teach. If we start taking on that attitude, then we run aground on 1 John, where John says, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. And if we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar. But if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. So my conscience can be a good conscience when it's working. And as I fall into sin... And I repent and I confess and I feel the godly sorrow and the indignation and the frustration with myself. And somehow we feel a little bit defiled as we should because we have that broken and contrite spirit. So when does the good conscience, what exactly does it mean when Paul said, I live before God in a good conscience? So the purpose of the gospel is a good conscience. So let's just kind of think about this for a minute. What what do we have to feel in our hearts to have a good conscience? If I were to ask you, all of you, raise your hand. Do you have a good conscience tonight? Have you had a good conscience this year as you look back on the year? What about your life since you've become a Christian? How about before you became a Christian? As you go back over all of those periods in your life, how does your conscience, do you feel like you have a good conscience? Do you feel like your conscience is is clear that it is it is it has done as as well as it could possibly do. If we feel guilt, does that mean, nope, you don't have a good conscience. Anytime you feel guilt, that means you don't have a good conscience. And if you don't have a good conscience, then the gospel's not producing what it's supposed to produce in you. What if we know we still need to grow and become better? Does that give us a good conscience? What if I didn't do something this week that I should have done and I feel a lot of regret over it and I wish I could change it? Does that mean I'll never have a good conscience again? Or is there something I need to do about that? If we have that broken and contrite spirit. You remember Jesus in the parable, or excuse me, in the Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are the poor in spirit. The word poor there means destitute, poverty, humility, a a realization and a recognition that we are not what we should be. That we could be better. We should be better. We should be doing more. Like Paul said in Philippians chapter 3. Not that I've already attained Not that I've already been perfected, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and stretching forward to what lies ahead. How could Paul have a good conscience when he feels like that? When he feels like, I I haven't done all that I could have done. I haven't reached and become what I know I should be and could be. But then Paul gives us a little bit of a hint when he says that the gospel is an upward call. And as an upward call, 
we're never going to be where we want to be. Because that's the purpose of the gospel, is to lead us ever higher. And of course, as we're going higher, we are realizing, and this was a, a conundrum that I dealt with probably in my 30s, I started realizing it was that a preacher was always way ahead of his understanding if he's growing as a preacher, if he's developing, if he's studying the scriptures. And of course, Christian is the same thing, but I'm just talking about my personal experiences. And I found that I'm always about 10 steps ahead in my understanding of what I can actually do. And it's frustrating because the things you set as goals when you were first converted, you reach those, but you don't get a chance to feel good about yourself because 10 more have come in. And then when you get those 10 more pretty well in line, then here's some more. And then along with that is the things that we know we should be doing better. Some of us are really good at praying. Some of us are not. Some of us are really good at personal evangelism. Some of us are not. Some of us are really good at confessing our sins and repenting. And some of us really struggle with that. And some of us have a real deep faith that we trust God has forgiven us. And some people really struggle with whether God has forgiven them or not. And so these are the things that we have to plug in if we're going to say, I have a good conscience or I don't. I don't have a good conscience. <clears throat> so what is a good conscience? I think that although many people, when they read this verse, they immediately go to, well, wait a minute, how could Paul live in all good conscience when he was persecuting the church and he was the chief of sinners and, and he was a blasphemer and he was injurious? And well, that's the point. Paul could have a good conscience in spite of the fact that he was the chief of sinners, in spite of the fact that he could still write in 1 Corinthians, which was just before this book was written, he could still write there, I'm less than the least of all the apostles. I'm not even worthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church. But then he says, but his grace has led me to work harder than all the other apostles, yet not me, but the grace of God that is in me. So this good conscience is a very complicated and a very difficult thing to nail down. And only God can really tell us because although the psychiatrists and psychologists will tell us what they think a conscience is, only the scriptures can really reveal exactly what it is that God had in mind when he put that within us and how it has uh, changed or modified because of sin entering into our hearts. Because once sin entered our hearts, everything was twisted and perverted and things that were supposed to work perfectly uh, no longer worked perfectly at all. <clears throat> so Paul says, I have always lived in a good conscience. I like that. Now, I may not be able to explain it, but it makes me feel good to know that I have a man that I can look at his life and I can see his flaws and his imperfections and his weaknesses and I can see his feelings and guilt and sense of remorse and regret and yet at the same time I can see he's just like me. And he says he had a good conscience. So now I have something that I can, that I can work toward or that we can work toward. Paul said in uh, Acts chapter 24 and verse 16, this being so, I myself always strive. To have a good conscience without offense toward God and men. Now keep this one in the back, excuse me, keep this one in the back of your mind. Because here we tie two things together, a good conscience and without offense. In other words, when I go back over my previous time that I've dealt with people, if I've been forgiven, you know, you think about somebody like David. Did David ever have a good conscience again after he murdered Bathsheba's husband? After he committed adultery? After he brought great opportunities for the unbelievers to blaspheme God? And after God said, the sword will never depart from your house. And I don't know how David lived with himself when he thought about Absalom. Oh, Absalom, my son, my son, would that I had died for you. Oh, Absalom, my son, my son. And I think we can all relate to that. Those of us who are parents and those of us who can look back over the way we raised our children and realize I wasn't really prepared. I thought I was at the time, but I wish I could go back and do it again. And I'm so sorry. And I've, I've apologized to all my children for certain things in their upbringing because I wish I'd done better. 
I've never felt it's wrong to apologize to your children. You're trying to be a good example to them. If you want them to apologize for their mistakes, then the least you could do is apologize for yours. That's an honorable thing to do. And it doesn't lower them in our eyes at all. But these are the kinds of things that you look back on. Like David, like Paul, like Abraham. I wonder how Abraham felt about him lying to Abimelech and Abimelech rebuking him and saying, look, what did I do to you that you would do this to me, that you would tell me that woman is your sister when she's your wife and you brought all this trouble down on my head? I wonder how, how Abraham dealt with that. We, we all have things in our past we're ashamed of. Can we ever have a good conscience? Well, Paul said, I've always strive. But above that, in verse 23, he said, I always have. I have. So maybe we need to reevaluate this good conscience and think about it as maybe this is a good conscience like a good heart, a good and honest heart. I want to have a good and honest heart. And I believe I do because I'm always like the Bereans searching the scriptures to see whether these things are so. But would you say, oh, Alan, does that mean you think you're perfect? Does that mean you think you're sinless? Do you really think you're good? Well, no, no, I don't mean that when I say I have a good heart. I mean that I have a heart that is functioning to the best that it can function under the present set of circumstances that we're living under. And I think that may be what Paul is talking about when he says a good conscience. A good conscience is a working conscience. A conscience, is a conscience that is doing what it has been designed to do. <clears throat> For our boasting is this, the testimony of our conscience that we conducted ourselves in the world in simplicity and godly sincerity, not with fleshly wisdom, but by the grace of God and more abundantly toward you. Second Corinthians chapter one. So the testimony of our conscience that we conducted ourselves in the world in simplicity and godly sincerity. Now, maybe if we put black on white here. We have a passage in 1 Timothy 4 that says that those people who are following the doctrines of demons are branded in their conscience with a hot iron. Their conscience is seared. Their conscience has been damaged. Searing means that you no longer have feeling in that part of your body. If you're branded, then if you take your finger and you scratch it, you're not going to feel anything because the nerves are gone. You're dead. And so a branded conscience, a defiled conscience, is a conscience that when I look back over last week, last month, last year, I don't feel good about it at all. Matter of fact, I'm not happy with it at all. Because it's defiled. It's, it's just something that shouldn't be. And that's when I, when, at the end of a sermon sometimes, I'll say that. You know, brother, we shouldn't go year after year or week after week thinking about an event that happened last month or last year and just knowing I've got to take care of this. I've got to do something about this. I can't just let it go. I haven't, I haven't fully repented and I certainly haven't confessed because people know about it and they don't know that I've repented, which is what Jesus demanded and what Paul demanded. So as we consider these things and as we look at the conscience and as we think about the good conscience, the bad conscience, the functioning conscience, the non-functioning conscience, 2 Timothy 1, 3, I thank God whom I serve with a pure conscience. As my forefathers did. Who's he talking about? Well, he's talking about those people in Acts, or excuse me, in Hebrews chapter 11. He's talking about our fathers, Abraham our father, and Isaac and Jacob, and, and all of those people. They're our brethren. They are our, our fathers in the faith. And they were serving God with a pure conscience. Now, Abraham wasn't sinless. David wasn't sinless. Uh, Isaiah, Elijah, these were not sinless men because all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Yet in spite of that, they were serving God with a pure conscience. Why? Because God lowered the standard so I can still feel good about myself even though I don't measure up in any way, shape, matter, or form. None of us do. We are unprofitable servants, Jesus said. We have only done our duty. And no matter how much of the gospel we put into ourselves, we can't change the fact that we were sinners and that it's only because of God's grace and God's mercy and God's compassion. But that's enough 
Paul said, for him to have a good conscience, a pure conscience, and a conscience that is without offense, and the testimony of which makes him feel good. So do we have a good conscience? Is this helpful? You can feel guilt. You can feel remorse. You can understand that you could have done better and should have done better. You can realize that you're a sinner. But as I said, like those 10 spies that went into the promised land, they didn't have the faith to see that God was going to make up for whatever lacks they had and they were going to be victorious. And that's what Paul says about us. We are more than conquerors through him that loved us. We're not victims. We are more than conquerors. By faith, I understand that if I ask God to forgive me for all of my sins... That's all I can do. And at that point, I should have a good conscience. Now, does that mean I won't regret? No, I'm going to regret. Paul regretted. Does that mean I'm not going to have any remorse, that I'm not going to cringe, that I'm not even going to cry sometimes because of the stupidity or the folly of what it took to get me where I am today? And, and we're all doing that. But where does the good conscience come in? Well, that's what we, we, we kind of want to explore. <clears throat> so... Paul tells us, you can follow my example. Several places. Look at this one. Brethren, join in following my example. And note those who so walk as you have us for a pattern. So Paul is a pattern. Now, how much of his life is a pattern? Well, shall I go back to Acts chapter 7 and or 8? And, yeah, 7 and 8 and say, okay, well, here's my pattern. No, that's, that's not a pattern. Not everything in Paul's life was a pattern. But the things that the, that the Holy Spirit stamped with divine inspiration as we go through the book of Acts. Let me jump ahead to this passage and we'll come back and look at this again. Here's what Paul told Timothy. You have carefully followed my doctrine, <clears throat> my manner of life, my purpose, my faith, my long suffering, my love, my perseverance, my persecutions, afflictions, which happened to me at Antioch, Iconium, at Lystra, what persecutions I endured, and out of them all the Lord delivered me. And of course, I skipped it, but the next verse is, all who live godly in Christ Jesus are going to suffer persecution. And that's another serious conscience issue, isn't it? You do the very best you can to talk to your neighbor about the gospel, and it all blows up in your face. And now they hate you. And you're thinking to yourself, could I have done that better? Well, could Jesus have done it any better? I mean, look how it ended up. They hated him. Was that his fault? Should he have a bad conscience because they wanted to crucify him? Should Paul have a bad conscience because Rome wanted to put him to death? No. And so what's Paul telling Timothy? You have carefully followed. Now, the word followed there has the same idea of following the example. What do we follow? We, Paul, we follow Paul's teachings. We follow his doctrine because we know his doctrines are inspired. But we also learn here that his manner of life and his purpose and his faith and his long suffering, his perseverance, persecutions and afflictions are also stamped with divine inspiration. You say, well, how do you know that, Alan? Well, let's go back and look at this verse again. The things which you learned and received. That's the doctrine. And heard and saw in me. That's the lifestyle. These do. And the God of peace will be with you. I couldn't make a statement like that. I'd be terrified to tell you, look, if you do everything I do exactly the way I do it, you'll get to heaven. But that's what Paul said. And he didn't say it. He said it inspired. The Holy Spirit inspired him to say this. You can look at my life in the book of Acts. You can look at my life in the epistles. You can see what I endured in the first Corinthian letter, second Corinthian letter. Little threads of his life pulled through all the different scriptures, the book of Acts and all his epistles. The things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me. These do. And the God of peace will be with you. And then again, that previous verse in Philippians 3.17. Now, I realize the passage in Philippians 3.17 and 18 is focused primarily on his statements regarding how he'd started out as a Pharisee, but that he had rejected all of that and counted it rubbish that he might gain Christ. Again, how much you regret all of that. And then he says, I haven't already attained. But one thing I do. Forgetting what lies behind, stretching to what lies ahead, I rest, I stretch toward the upper call of God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, as many of you as are perfect, join in following my example. And note those who walk 
is you have us for a pattern. The word pattern there is what we do with our money. We take these pieces of uh, blanks of, of <coughs> copper and whatever nickels and quarters and dollars are made of, and then we stamp them with a pattern. And if you take them, you take hundreds of them and you put them in front of you, they all look the same. Well, they used to all look the same. They don't anymore because every state has its own. But every state that has its own, it's all the same pattern. Paul is a pattern. He told the Corinthians, be imitators of me as I also am of Christ. And the Holy Spirit is stamping this. So if the inspired Paul could tell us to follow his example, and Paul said, I always had a good conscience, I feel pretty comfortable that we can follow him in that. I feel pretty comfortable that, that when Paul says some of the things that he says about his regrets, about his remorse, about his sorrows, about his disappointments, that, and still say I have a good conscience, that that means something. And that I can take that and I can plug that in and maybe feel a little better about myself. Because oftentimes we all, have, we all carry these things. And again, some of us are a little more, I guess, a little harder on ourselves, a little more tender conscience, a little more tender hearted than, than others. <clears throat> Saul arose from the ground and when his eyes were opened, he saw no one. But they led him by the hand, they brought him into Damascus, and he was three days without sight, neither ate nor drank. Now, I think all of us can relate to Paul here. From the moment he heard Stephen's sermon, he laid waste the church. He made it his aim to eradicate the name of Jesus and to eradicate the church and to destroy everything about it because he believed It was contrary to God's will. And if he was right, if, if Christianity had not been true, he had taken the right course. As a matter of fact, that's what he said. Concerning zeal, persecuting the church. I wasn't like the rest of those Pharisees who just tolerated this. I was going to do something about it. And then on the road to Damascus, Jesus appears and says, Why are you persecuting me, Saul? Who are you, Lord? I'm Jesus. Can you imagine? I mean, here's a man who loves God with all of his heart, soul, and mind, and he just found out that he has been persecuting the Messiah, the King of Kings, and the Lord of Lords, the one that he's been waiting for that he didn't believe, but now it all clicks. I can't imagine. He wasn't eating. He couldn't see. And all he could do was pray for three days and three nights. And he didn't eat. He didn't drink. And when Jesus was talking to Ananias, he said this, Arise and go to the street called Straight and inquire at the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he's praying. I mean, here's the man who said, Pray without ceasing. And he talks in all of his letters about all the people. He knows how to pray. You can imagine what he's praying. Father, forgive me. Father, I can't believe it. I am so ashamed. I'm so disappointed. I'm so in anguish. It appears from some of the things Jesus said that he already knew he was going to be a coming apostle and that he already knew that's why Jesus had appeared to him. So he wasn't left completely without any hope. But it must have been an agonizing time for him. And yet he says to the, to the court in Acts 22, I've lived before God in all good conscience. Well, what's his conscience doing right now? It's working doing exactly what it's supposed to be doing. What he thought he was doing was right, turned out to be wrong. Now what? Godly sorrow, indignation, fear, vehement desire, clearing, uh, remorse, sorrow, all of these things tied into it. Is that okay? Yeah, that's all part of a good conscience. So here's what Paul tells us the conscience is actually doing, and this is, I'm sure, what Paul was going through at, at, as he went through this process. The conscience is bearing witness and accusing or excusing. So it's assessing our thoughts, our actions, and our deeds. It is accusing us when we have done wrong, and it's excusing us when we have done right. What's it doing to Paul right now? Accusing. How can you live before God in all good conscience to this day with your conscience accusing? That's what it's supposed to do. When I fall into sin willingly, unwillingly, and I come to myself like Paul or like Jesus told Peter, what was Peter supposed to do? 
after he went out and wept bitterly. What do you think his conscience was thinking? Here he is bragging to Jesus. I'm not going to deny you. Even if I have to die, I'm going to remain faithful. And Jesus is saying, Peter, before the cock crows, you're going to deny me. And before the cock crows twice, you're going to deny me three times. <clears throat> and then Jesus looked at him after that third denial. And it all came crashing down. What's Peter supposed to do? Can he ever have a good conscience again? Well, Jesus had already told him, when you come to yourself, establish my brethren. You're not going to be cast out, Peter. You're still a part of this. You're still a rock. I'm not going to change your name back to Cephas. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm not going to change your name back to Simon. I'm going to call you the rock. You're going to be Cephas. You're going to be Peter. So, as I say, it's complicated. Here's another example. This is Paul talking to the Romans about a truth that maybe would be hard to believe, and that is that uh, after all the persecutions and all the terrible things the Jews had done to him, all he feels is pain for them. He doesn't feel any vindictiveness. He doesn't want God to destroy them. He's not like James and John uh, asking the Lord to cast fire down upon them because they won't listen. He doesn't have any rancor. He said, I say the truth in Christ. I lie not my conscience bearing with me in the Holy Spirit that I have unceasing pain in my heart for my brethren according to the flesh, my kinsmen. Now, if Paul hadn't said all that, I might wonder, how could he say that? And how could he say that? And his conscience, look at what he says. So let's look at the, the three things that he says here. He says, I say the truth in Christ. Now, this is Paul affirming what he believes to be true. Then he says, I've, I've looked this all over and I'm not lying. I'm telling you the truth. This is exactly the truth. Then he says, my conscience has assessed everything that I've just said about not telling or, or not telling the truth and not lying. And my conscience is bearing witness. It's not accusing me. It's excusing me. And then the Holy Spirit is stamping it with divine inspiration. You can't get much more than this. So he, he affirms I'm telling the truth. He affirms I'm not lying. He affirms that my conscience is excusing me when I tell you I say the truth and I'm not lying. Have you ever done that? Telling somebody something and they look you in the eye. Are, are you sure you're telling the truth? And what does your conscience do at that point? Well, yeah, I'm telling the truth. Or, well, maybe I'm exaggerating a little bit. Mark, you can't, you can't, uh, you can't get around that conscience. Not if you have a good one. And the good one means it's working well. I don't think that we should look at the conscience and say the only way to have a good conscience is if you don't feel any guilt, any remorse, any sorrow. You just, <clears throat> you're just super happy with the past life because you picked all the right choices. Well, that's not Paul. And that's not any of the New Testament writers. And that's certainly not anybody I've ever met. Uh, if you're one of them, please come up and introduce yourself to me. I'd, I'd love to know somebody like that. That'd be wonderful. I'm speaking tongue in cheek because there just isn't anybody. All sin and fall short of the glory of God. And none of us are all that we want to be or could be. And if we think we are, then let him who thinks he stand take heed lest he fall. <clears throat> so he said it with his mind. He said, I'm not lying. His conscience is bearing witness. So there are two voices. The mind trying to justify, excuse, and accuse, and the conscience bearing witness, and even sometimes overruling and saying, you know, you're saying that, but you know it's not true. And how many times have we done that? We tell somebody something, and then the next day or the next week, we come back and say, you know, I, I have to talk to you. I told you something last week, and I've been feeling kind of uncomfortable about it. That means your conscience is working. You have a good conscience. So I've been feeling a little uncomfortable about it. I just want to clear it up. I shouldn't have said that. I said something about somebody. Please don't pass it on. I'm ashamed of myself because I said something or I told you something and, you know, I found out later it's not quite true. Or maybe you have to say, you know, I boldly lied to you last week and my conscience has been bothering me about it. There wouldn't be anything wrong with that. It'd be hard to do, but godly people would do it if they had a good conscience. <clears throat> now, we've talked about this one enough to, well, I don't think we need to go over it again, but Paul simply says, as far as I'm concerned, I'm the chief. 
Now, you think he's exaggerating here? No, because this is the Holy Spirit stamping it with divine inspiration. He was the chief. Nobody. If Paul had succeeded, every man, woman, and child who would have obeyed the gospel when they heard it in any time in the future, if Paul had been successful, the church would have been destroyed. No one has ever tried to fight against God to a more despicable end than the Apostle Paul, who was Saul of Tarsus. And he, he recognized that. I said I wasn't going to talk too much about it and did anyway. <clears throat> I was formerly a blasphemer. I said some terrible things about Jesus. And instead of loving my brethren, I persecuted them unto death and I strove to make them blaspheme. Not only was I a blasphemer, but I was an inquisitor and I was torturing people and I was threatening people and I was breathing threats and slaughter against the disciples is how uh, Luke puts it in the book of Acts. I was a blasphemer, a persecutor and an insolent man. How many years do you think you'd have to live before you could live with yourself for being one? You just have to have a lot of faith in God. That's one thing I appreciate about David and about Saul. They didn't quit. They didn't give up. I've met Christians who've done something terrible and they've just said, you know, that's it for me. It's time to hit the showers. I'm, I'm no longer worthy to, uh, to, to serve the Lord in the capacity because of what I've done. That is not true. That is not true. <clears throat> he, free, he freely acknowledged his past with regret with remorse, with godly sorrow, but though he could, and that should be could not, I think I slipped out and put, left out the not there. Though he could not change it, he still had a good conscience. That is a, how does it put, seasons of refreshing from the presence of the Lord. I like that this is in here because it gives me the sense that maybe I just didn't understood or didn't understand what a good conscience was. Maybe, maybe I need to reevaluate because when my conscience hurts me, I tell myself, you don't have a good conscience anymore. But that's not true. It's working perfectly. It's what I do with it after that that will determine whether I have a good conscience or not. And that is, will it force me to change or will I force it to shut up? And that's when we run into a big, serious problem. And see, that's what Paul never did. Paul always did what he thought was right as soon as he could. And that's, I believe, what made him say, I have a good conscience. So Paul has this broken and contrite spirit. I'm less than the least of all the saints. How can he say that? He worked harder than all. He was forgiven. No, but this is the truth. This is the truth. Of course, it's probably true for most of us. I mean, if we were really to think about it. <clears throat> I'm least of the apostles who am not worthy to be called an apostle. So he never forgot. It molded. It humbled. It strengthened. Counted all joy when you fall into manifold trials. You say, well, how can these be trials? Well, they were serious trials that he had to carry for the rest of his life. This agony, this grief, this sorrow, this remorse of what he had done. So let's just kind of sum this up. Paul couldn't change his past, and none of us can. I've got things in my past. You've got things in your past. Could have done better. Could have done more. Should have done less. Uh, could have had a better understanding. Could have worked harder. Could have acted on my, my intentions. Uh, but I can't go back and change it now. I have regrets. There are things that I can look back, and I still kind of cringe and hunker down when I think about them. I'm sure David did that. I know Paul did it. We're going to do it. Couldn't change the past. None of us can. But with baptism, they're washed away, remembered no more. It takes faith to have a good conscience when we remember the past. And that's why he starts with love out of a pure heart, a good conscience, and an unfeigned faith. So let's develop that in the, in the last few minutes of our, of our lesson. So there is also an antitype which now saves us, baptism, not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God. Now, why does my baptism give me the answer of a good conscience? 
Well, it all comes down to faith. I think most of us feel when we come up out of the water of baptism that we're the new creation. All things have passed away. Everything's become new. I start here. I don't have to go back prior to this moment. Anything that was done before baptism, I don't have to worry about. Now, does that mean I don't cringe over it? No, there's things back there that I wish I had done. There's things back there that I'm ashamed of, that I have feel remorse for, that I'm feeling guilty of. All of us have that. Paul had that. But the answer of the good conscience is, like Ananias told Paul in Acts 22, 16, why are you waiting? Arise, be baptized, wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. How could Paul not have a good conscience when he came up out of the water of baptism and he had God's promise and washed them all away? Now, does that mean Paul doesn't regret that he did them? No. We remember. Emotions are working. I mean, we go back. Baptism doesn't change the fact that we did some dumb things before we, or vile things, or disgusting things, or shamed things. But the conscience is good because I did everything I could to fix it. Nothing more I can do. Like David, he couldn't go back and bring uh, Uriah back to life. He couldn't go back and undo his act of adultery. He couldn't undo the blasphemy that was going on. He couldn't undo the violence that was against his his household. He couldn't under, undo the death of his son, which I'm sure he felt he bore some part in the way it all turned out. Because he didn't handle it well. You look back on how he handled that situation with Tamar and how that woman was raped and he did not deal with that properly. And it led Absalom to kill Amnon and then it led Absalom to reject his father. Paul's faith in God's power to forgive gave him that good conscience. Now after we are baptized, you can't go back and do that again. Some people like to do it again. And if you're not sure if it was done right the first time, you would want to do that. But we don't need to go back and do it again if we did it right the first time because repentance does the same thing. Godly sorrow produces repentance leading to salvation. Well, we are baptized leading unto salvation. Now, repentance does the same thing after, and I could add confession too, which we'll see in the next slide, but repentance and confession do exactly the same thing for the Christian that baptism does for the person in the world. And a question we have to ask ourselves, do we believe we were forgiven? I know, and you probably have done it, and I've, I've done it a few times. I ask God to forgive me of something that I've asked him to forgive me of 5, 10, 15, 20 times before, because that's how bad I feel about having done it. And what's God saying? You know, I forgot it the first time. What are you, why are you still bringing this up? I told you I'd forget it. I told you I'd remember it no more. I told you I'd put it, I'd wash it away. I'd cast it into the sea. Why do you keep bringing it up? We should have a good conscience because we trust in the Lord with all our heart and we're not leaning on our own understanding. And God has said, I've forgiven you and you are in my eyes, my son, a righteous, godly, holy man or woman. Godly sorrow produces repentance leading to salvation. Not to be regretted. But the sorrow of the world produces death. In other words, for every sin I've repented of, I have no regrets. And my conscience is clear. But the sorrow of the world, if I haven't done that, I need to take care of it. For observe this very thing. Now this is what godly sorrow produces. If we sorrow in a godly manner, it's going to produce diligence, clearing of yourselves, which means you're going to go out of your way to take care of it in every possible way, indignation, sometimes directed at another, in the case of this situation where we have this Corinthian fornicator, as Paul said in the previous chapter, I don't want to press too hard, but he brought troubles on all of you. But now you forgive him lest he be swallowed up in overmuch sorrow. But there's also the indignation toward ourselves. I'm sure that Corinthian fortigator had some indignation. What a dope. What a fool. Why did I do that? I can't believe that I could be so stupid, so ignorant, so, so vile, so weak. What fear. What vehement desire. I'm going to do better. What zeal. What vindication. These are powerful emotions. Emotions that don't always go away a week or two or a month or two or even 10 or 15 years later depending on the depth of the sin and the depths of the mistake and the consequences that have come as a result of it. But Paul said, I've lived before God in all good conscience. 
So we can deal with that. We can still have a good conscience even though we're carrying all of that. And like I said, that's, a, that's quite a relief. Quite a release. If we say we have no sin, if that's how you're going to try to get a good conscience, you deceive yourselves, the truth is not in you. If we confess our sins, a good conscience is honest. It accuses, it excuses, it forces, it demands. But when we follow when we don't violate it, when we make it, when it does what it's designed to do, it accuses us, we repent. It accuses us, we're baptized. It accuses us, we confess. Done. By faith, we understand. By faith, we trust God. It's done. The blood of Christ has cleansed it. It's like it's never been between you and God. Now, does that mean you're going to forget it? Paul never did. Peter never did. No one ever does. <clears throat> so, a good conscience lives in the present moment. I can't go back, my conscience can't go back and change any of the things I've already done. And if, I, if that's what it takes to have a good conscience, no one's ever going to have a good conscience. The conscience is accusing or excusing today. Now, if there's anything in my heart today that it's still accusing me of, that I'm searing it, and I'm defiling it, and I may lose it. I may end up with a bad conscience. But if I've taken every taken care of everything up to this present moment, and you know, it's so easy to take care of that. Sometimes in the morning, I, I do most of my praying in the morning. Sometimes in the morning, I just kind of have this sinking some sensation that maybe something I haven't done, or should have done, or did do, and I haven't probably cared for. You know how easy that is to take care of? Father... I am so ashamed of myself. I feel poorly this morning. I feel that I've sinned against you. Uh, if I've done anything I don't remember, please forgive me. If I've done anything that I'm not aware of yet, would you please bring it to my attention, but forgive me. Would you please bless me with forgiveness? Whew. Okay, it's done. Sin cannot have dominion over you because you're not under law, you're under grace, and you can take care of it any moment of any day. The remorse, the contrition, they may remain, but God did what, he, what needed to be done. So when we sin, the conscience starts working. It's a good conscience. If we repent and do what's right, it stays good. If we don't, then we end up with this, verse 2, conscience seared with a hot iron, or to the pure, all things are pure, but to those who are defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. So, as we conclude our lesson this evening, I don't know that I've fully answered it. I'm not sure that I have a full answer. I think these are just some of the things that are helping me lead toward what the true answer is. But I know Paul is my example. I know Paul lived before God in all good conscience. And I know that Paul was struggling and dealing with the same difficulties and problems that I am regarding some of the things that were done in the past. And yet he had a good conscience. So as we now reach for the song of encouragement and we open up to number 316. Is your conscience accusing you right now as we've gone through this lesson? Is your conscience excusing you right now? You feel good about this lesson? You feel good about it? I feel good about the way I preached it. Sometimes I go home, I don't feel good about it. Then I have to fix it. I come forward or come up the next Sunday. You know, I said something last Sunday night. I don't feel good about it. That's how you keep a good conscience. How about you with the sermon? You feel good about it. If you don't, why not? If it's error, come talk to me. We'll take care of it. I'll apologize if I said something wrong. But if it's not error, if it's because you realize something's not quite right, take care of it. Live with a good conscience. Get that conscience back into good shape where it's excusing you. And the next time it accuses you, take care, take care of it more quickly. As we sing the song of encouragement this evening, if there's anyone here who needs to rise and be baptized and wash away your sins, if there's anyone here with godly sorrow who needs to confess their sin, we would like to give you that opportunity to take advantage of that and take care of it while we together now stand.